What's up, Focus Church? How's everybody doing today? Come on. I know this. I know I got some people that are wide awake. I got some people that are wide awake, don't I? I got some people that aren't, aren't so awake right now, do I? Some of you are, are still getting there. And in fact, let me, let me just encourage you with this. Um, I heard uh, in our prayer service at, at 9 a.m., uh, Pastor, Pastor Ben said something that I felt was a little, was a little bit sacrilegious, is really what I, I thought it was, Pastor Ben, that, uh, that, that you said that you, you like the clouds and the rainy days. What in the world kind of, like you're living in the wrong city, brother, that's what you are. We're going to send you up to Seattle for a vacation one of these days, all right? And here's the thing, I don't know about you, but when I got a cloudy day and we got a little bit of, of rain that's been there, the, the, the temperature's nice. Can I get an amen? Because we all know what's coming, don't we, right? But here's the thing about that is that when we, when we think about that, we're like, oh, it's coming. Or then when we got a rainy day, oh, I got the rainy day kind of blues. And I just want to encourage you today with something. I just want to encourage you that what, whatever kind of attitude that you might have walked in here with today, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to just be honest with yourself and maybe put that attitude in check because you're not sure how that attitude might even affect the people that are around you. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going to encourage you to be able to do something. Be honest with yourself. I'm going to ask you to actually be honest with yourself many, many times today. And I'm going to start with just simply asking you to be honest with your attitude that you have when you walked in here today. Are you ready to hear from the Word? Are you ready to hear from God today? And maybe some of you are, maybe some of you just aren't. Well, I believe that God still has for so something for you whether you're ready or not. Whether you're ready or not, here we go. God, I just pray right now for you to be able to check our hearts. Check my heart. Make sure that my attitude is correct. Make sure that I'm in a place that I can hear from you. I pray that everybody's ears will be open so that they can hear truly from you today. I pray that you will open up our minds so that we can understand you today. I pray that you're going to open up our hearts so that we might experience you today. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says... Now it's about the time of the message where I would be able to kind of bring you in on something. I'm going to tell you a fun little story, something that might make you laugh, something that might make you cry. I might get you something that would, would pull you in and make it so that you want to be able to hear what God has to say for you today. But I ain't got time for that. We don't have time for any of that today. Instead, there's a lot of teaching that is going to come your way today. Because we're in the middle of a series called The Valley, and we know that each and every single one of us walks through valleys of life, difficult situations. And if we aren't careful, our attitude can begin to think that we are victims in the valley. Instead, I know this, that there is victory in the valley. Can I get an amen? I know this because the Bible tells me so. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this. It says, but thanks be to God. He gives us victory. Somebody say victory. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here is what I know about my valley. Here's what I know about your valley. There is victory found in the valley. Can I get an amen? There's going to be some power today. Because I believe this. I believe that even though there, there is victory in the valley, that there are too many people who are walking around with a victim mentality. Here's what I know. It's not just people who don't know Jesus. It's people who know Jesus. Amen. And here's why I'm in this series right now. Because can I just be honest with you? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what else to do. But be honest with you. I'm sick of it. Aren't you sick of it? Aren't you sick of seeing other people walking through a victim mentality? More importantly... Aren't you sick of it yourself? Aren't you in a place where you're like, I'm tired. I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of thinking this way. I'm tired of living this way. Instead, walk in the victory that God has for you. And the reason why I'm talking about this and why I'm so passionate about this is because I know this, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time today and I don't have enough time in my life to waste it trying to make you just feel comfortable 
and okay. I've just got to the place where I just know that my time is too short. And i got to call it out. Can you call it out in yourself? Can you be honest with yourself? Can you realize that you're living as a victim instead of a victor? Maybe not. Maybe you can look at this screen and see some of the, as I was doing study for this, these are some of the attributes that people have as a victim. And when you see this, you're thinking, I don't like that because you just described me a little bit closer than I would like to, right? These are some of the, the signs of victim mentality. Blaming other people. It's not my fault, right? It's not my fault that I'm in a fight with my wife. If she would just be rational every once in a while. No guys have thought that before, huh? Now, how about this one? Refusal to take responsibility. Well, it's, you know what? It's, 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 become defensive. Ooh, how about that one? Somebody confronts you with something and the very first thing that you do, hey, 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 you're taking it the wrong way. Hey, 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 I didn't mean it. Hey, hey. You get defensive, right? Boy, that's the first thought of many of us, isn't it? I know I fall into that one. Can we be honest with ourselves? I fall into that one. How about complaining instead of problem solving? Welcome to church, y'all. <laughs> well, hey, pastor, I got something I need to let you know about. Yes, I know that there's a line in the middle of the screen. I know that, there, that you can't see the words during worship. I know this. Do you think that we have not tried to solve this before? Yes, we have. <laughs> Complaining. I'm speaking to somebody right now, and you don't like it. Because you're re refusing to take responsibility, huh? Ooh, now we're just getting into it. I'm just being honest with somebody today. I ain't got time to do anything else but be honest. Catastrophic thinking. Well, the end of the world is happening. I just got busted for this thing, and the end of the world is happening. This is also the martyr syndrome, huh? Oh, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. Everything's all my fault all the time. I got any martyrs in the room today? Don't raise your hand on that one. Don't raise your hand on that one. But you know who you are, don't you? And if you don't know who you are, your spouse knows who you are. All or nothing. Well, if this didn't work out, then I guess we just got to take my ball and run and go home. Magnifying others' wrongdoings to minimize our own. They were speeding more than I was. Can we all be honest? Can you be honest with yourself? Every single one of us falls into this at times. Every single one of us, when we are not careful, can fall into a victim mentality. But we have to guard our hearts to make sure that we are not living as a victim. Instead, we are living as victors. Can I get an amen? And the reason why that we are falling into that idea sometimes when we're in the middle of our valley is because we truly do not understand the valley that we're in. We think it's one valley and we're trying to attack that when the truth is we're living in something very completely different. We're going through a valley that is very, very different. So instead, what we're trying to do is I'm trying to bring light to your valley. The reason why you don't see victory in your valley is because it is dark. You are living in a dark place and you know that it's dark because you think that it's hopeless. You think that you're never going to get through this thing and it is just so hard. Instead, we're going to bring light to your valley so that you can see the victory that's around you. Week one, we went through the valley of opposition, where it feels like there's somebody who's coming against me. But the reality is, I told you that it was my valley of opposition was not the valley of opposition, it was the valley of selfishness. I was concerned about myself more than helping somebody else out. Come on, somebody. Last week, we got to talk about the valley of hopelessness. And Pastor Jessica, in a powerful way, shared something so personal with her that it's not the valley of hopelessness, but the valley of shame and guilt that many of us are going through. And today, we're going to talk about something that I know is close to many of you, and it's the valley of trouble. Anybody ever been in trouble? Anybody ever, anybody ever been called to the principal's office? Oh my goodness, what did I do? 
what did I do? What did they catch me doing? <laughs> right? It's the first thought that goes through our mind. Oh, my goodness. Pastor calls me up. Hey, we need to meet. Oh, what did I do? What did, right? Like, that's how it feels at times, doesn't it? I'm in trouble. Just this week. Just this week, I was driving. I love driving in Arizona because we get to drive fast in Arizona. Can I get an amen? And those of you that did not say amen, you're the ones that are like, oh, all these people are driving fast. Get out of my way, okay? If you don't know, it's a race, all right? A race for wherever I'm going that I'm going to get there before you do, okay? When I'm driving on the 60, I'm racing you. Did you not know that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And those of you that are shaking your heads, you're the one. Get over in the right lane, okay? Just get over in the right lane. The racers are over in the left lane. I got any left lane people that are saying amen? Amen, right? Come on now. I know I'm talking to somebody. And one of the things I love about Arizona is, and, and specifically right where we're at, is I love, I love the exit on and off of 24 and the 202. Right? You know, anybody with me? Anybody with me? Anybody with me with that? That big, huge, sweeping curve that says only 55, but y'all know you could go 100 miles an hour on that thing. Can I get any man? Anybody with me? Not that I know that you could go 100. Woo, baby. This is what my automobile was made for. If they didn't want me to go that fast, why does my speedometer go there? I love the 24 so much. I love it. And I was, I was getting off the 24, and I'm getting ready to go on, on the 202, and, and I'm on this big, huge sweeping curve, and I'm moving like I usually do. But all of a sudden, I was like, ah, you know what? I'm relaxed today. Let me go ahead and slow down a little bit. And as soon as I had that thought, let me slow down a little bit. All of a sudden, a truck that was right behind me comes flying up on me and lights appear in my rear view mirror. And I thought, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Not with the police officer, with Pastor Jenny. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Oh, goodness. The first thing I do as soon as that happens, boom, I hit the brakes, right? Turn on the turning signal. I'm pulling over. I'm getting out of the way, and, and I'm expecting all of the horrible things, and I'm going through, and, it, and I'm in victim mentality. It's not my fault. It wasn't me. I'm blaming everybody else around me. I'm not taking responsibility. Hey, he was going faster. All of those things are going through my mind, and then all of a sudden, the victory of Jesus. He goes flying around me and then takes off on the 202. And I was like, praise Jesus, there's victory in the valley. There's victory in the valley, y'all. Woo! Anybody been in trouble in here before? We've all been in trouble. Every single one of us. And what we're getting ready to go through is we're going to go through a valley called trouble. The Israelites went through a valley called trouble. They had victory after victory after victory. And when God was bringing them into the promised land that he had given them, they had a victory by walking over the Jordan River on dry, land, on dry ground. It was a victory that they saw. It was a victory that they saw. The very first city that they came to is a city called Jericho with mighty walls that were around. And they thought, how on earth are we going to be able to defeat this city? And God told them, it's not your battle, it's my battle. And all they had to do was walk around that city for six days. And on the seventh day, walked around on seven days and, or seven times, and then they just shouted out the praise. And we know this, Focus Church, that when the praise goes up, come on, somebody, when the praise goes up, and those walls came tumbling down. Victory that was found in front of them. And then they went to the very next city. It was the city of Ai. How many of y'all know Ai is trouble? <laughs> Ooh, we're feeling trouble with Ai. It's going to take over. I saw Terminator. I know how that movie goes, y'all. We got trouble. They had trouble at the city of Ai. They thought, this is a small city. God defeated Jericho in a powerful way. We got this thing in the bag. I'm just going to go ahead. Joshua, he's the leader at that time, and he says, I'm only going to send about 3,000 people up there. It's no big deal. And then they were defeated. Defeated. I got trouble. And then God says, hey, I need you to do this. I need you to go confront this man Achan because he has sinned. And Achan replied, it's true. I have sinned. Somebody say sin. We've all sinned before. 
And he says, it's true, I sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. See, they were commanded everything that Jericho had, that the first and best goes to God. The first and our best goes to God, and that same principle is true for us today. Our first and our best goes to God. It all belongs to Him, and we're just bringing it back as an offering. They were hidden in the ground beneath my tent, and the silver buried deep in the rest. They continue on in verse 24. And then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar, and the gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, tent, everything he had, and they brought to them in the valley of Achor. And Jesus said to Achan, why have you brought trouble? Somebody say trouble. Why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. Continue on. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burned their bodies. They piled a great heap of stones over Achan, which remains to this day. That is why this place has been called the Valley of Trouble. Somebody say trouble. trouble. The Lord was no longer angry. We've all been in trouble before. We're all in that valley. We all get scared in that valley. We all wonder how we're going to get out of that valley. How am I going to deal with this trouble that I'm in? But the reality is I'm trying to bring light to that valley. More importantly, I'm trying to bring freedom from that valley. And the reality is this. The valley of trouble is not really the valley of trouble. The valley that we're in in the valley of trouble is the valley of sin. I've been in trouble more times than I can count. I got more stories than I've ever shared with y'all. And I can tell you that they all had to do with sin. It was either my sin or the sin of some knuckleheads that I was hanging out with. But all the trouble that I've ever been in started with sin. And if you're in this place today and you got some trouble, can you be honest with yourself and realize it started with some sin? But I believe that there is victory. Can I get an amen? I believe there's victory to be found in the middle of the valley of sin. Amen. I want you to know that I'm getting ready to teach you how to have victory out of your valley. Anybody want to have victory out of their valley of sin? I don't know about you, but I don't want to stay in sin. I don't want to feel that feeling. I don't want to be in that place where I'm just like horrible and you know it's eating you up inside and you're just waiting for the moment that you're going to get caught. You're waiting for that moment where it's going to be there and you know how hard it is. I believe that there is victory out of that valley. Anybody ready for some victory today? I'm getting ready to teach you, but you got to be honest with yourself. Because the very first thing that you've got to be able to do to get out of that valley of sin, you've got to acknowledge your sin. You've got to be honest about it. You can't try to be a victim about it, blame other people, refuse to take responsibility for it. No, you've got to acknowledge what it is. Call it out. Be honest with yourself. If you want to experience victory, you have to be honest about it. Otherwise, you're just living in darkness. There's no light that's going to be there. You've got to bring light to it. Be honest. Acknowledge your sin. Ephesians chapter 5 says this. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. I love that word carefully. I, I, I love that, the fact that I have to take a moment and I got to think about things. It doesn't matter if I'm 12 years old or if I'm 112 years old. I need to continually determine what I'm doing is pleasing the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. you got to bring light. There needs to be light. I'm going to tell you where sin grows. It grows in darkness. It grows in secret. That's where sin is going to fester. Instead, when you bring light to it, when you are honest about it, when you can actually acknowledge what your sin is, whoo, freedom begins to be found. Victory begins to be found. I'm telling you today, don't let it stay in darkness. 
Don't do it. Well, do you know how hard it is for me to tell somebody about the sin that I have? Yes, I do. Because I've been there. I'm just telling you and showing you the way out of that valley so that you can have victory. It is shameful to even talk about these things that are ungodly and doing, people do in secret. But the evil, their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. Stop living in darkness and instead acknowledge the sin that you have. And then this is a key. Once you acknowledge it, now it takes another step. Now you need to repent of your sin. See, some, sometimes we're living in a world right now where, okay, I can acknowledge it. I can, I can say this is how I'm living. But now we're living in a culture that says, this is how I'm living, and now you need to accept the way that I'm living. That's not how it goes, y'all. I don't live by my feelings. I don't live by what the world tells me. I live by the word of God. And what the word of God says is how I'm supposed to live. And so I'm not going to be in the place where it says, well, this is just who I am. No, it's not. That's not who I am. That's what sin is. And we live in a culture that is trying to force a lifestyle of sin upon us. So instead, I acknowledge my sin, and now I need to repent of it, which means this. I ask for forgiveness from God, and I turn away from living that way and live the way that God wants me to live. I've got to turn away from it. Stop. Stop living that way and start living the way that God wants me to live. Right. Acts 2, 38 says this. Peter replied, each of you must repent. Somebody say repent. Yeah. You must repent of your sins and turn to God. And then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You must repent. It is not just enough to acknowledge it. Now you must repent of it. See, here's the reality. Achan acknowledged what he did, but he didn't repent of it. He just said, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. But he didn't repent of it. What would have happened if there would have been a repenting heart that was attached to it? 1 John 1, uh, 8 through 9 says this. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. That sounds like the world that we live in right now, doesn't it? Is there anybody in here who might be living that way as well? But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. There is victory in your valley. You do not have to stay in the valley of sin any longer. I'm telling you, there is a way out of that valley. There is a way out of that valley. You do not need to stay there any longer. You can get yourself on out of there and you, do, you can stop living in the darkness. Acknowledge it. Repent of it. And now here's something. This last little bit is where I think that so many Christians fall short. And why we get stuck in a cycle of sin. I know that there are many of you in here today who get stuck in a cycle of sin. And that cycle of sin is this. I feel horrible for what I've done. I can't believe that I did this horrible thing. And I go to church and I'm hearing about how good God is and, and how I need him in my life and I need to repent because I'm sick and tired of living this way. And so I need to, to get it on out. And, and so I repent of my sins and all of a sudden all of that weight and all of that junk is gone. And I feel good again because of Jesus and how good he is, right? Anybody been there before? I mean, all of a sudden, like, all that weight is gone, and you begin to, to realize his freedom and how good that he is. And, and the next day you wake up, and you're like, man, I'm so thankful for how good God is, and, and I'm not carrying that sin around anymore. And you've got a great week that's ahead of you. And then maybe, maybe you've got a couple of months that are just so good, and, and you're feeling really good. And, and then the next thing you know, you let your guard down. And then you got tempted by that same thing that had trapped you before. And that temptation is rearing its ugly head. And it's coming after you. 
But you can't say no because it's got such a grip on you. And the next thing you know, you're not just being tempted, but now you're sinning again. And now you've fallen back into the exact same thing that you've done before. And you feel horrible about it again. And you go to church and you're hearing another message and you're like, i got to repent of this stuff. i got to get it out. And that cycle just keeps happening over and over and over again. But I believe with everything inside of me that each of you can stop the cycle of sin and you can live in freedom from sin. You can live in freedom from sin. You don't have to go through that cycle any longer. Instead, you can live in freedom from that thing that has been wrecking your soul. See, I'm telling you, I told you how to be able to have victory out of the valley of sin, but I got something even better for you today. I believe that there is victory from even entering into the valley of sin. Come on, somebody. Is anybody sick and tired of that cycle? Anybody sick and tired of going back to the same old things that have wrecked your life over and over and over again? Anybody sick of that? There is victory from even going back into the valley of sin any longer. And I'm getting ready to teach you how to do that. I had somebody just the other day, somebody in our church, they were like, hey, pastor, from your experiences that you've had, how have you found it to be able to withstand the sin that the world gives you? And I thought, man, that's a powerful question. And that question actually began to shape this, this message today. And so I just told him. I said, number one, how you can stop going back into that valley, how you can stop the cycle of sin, number one, what you need in your life is you need accountability. Amen. You need accountability. Because here's what I know about you and here's what I know about me. We are weak, y'all. We are weak. The, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You are weak, and I am weak. And so I need people around me who can help make me strong. The way we call that around here is our wolf pack, right? That you're only as strong as your pack. You need to be able to have strong people around you. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. I need somebody in my life who loves me and who loves Jesus. Come on, somebody. I need accountability. I need somebody who's going to keep me accountable. James 5, 16 says this. It says, confess your sins one to another, then you're going to be able to find healing. Come on, somebody. You've got to confess that, not just to God, but if you don't confess it to somebody else, it stays secret. It stays in the dark. You've got to tell somebody. You need to have accountability in your life. I'm a, I need some friends. And I'm not just talking about any friends. I'm not talking about just friends that like, hey, they, they want to hang around me. No, I'm not looking for friends that are just interested in me. I'm looking for people who have my best interest in mind. I'm looking for strong, godly men. Women in here, you need strong, godly women. Here's the kind of people that you need in your life. You need the kind of people who are going to call you out and then call you up. Woo. You need somebody who's going to call you out on your junk. Because you know what you got? Junk. You know what I got? Junk. And I need somebody who's going to call me out on that. And then not just call me out, but then they're going to show me the way to Jesus. Come on, man. You know the way you're supposed to live. You know the way you're supposed to talk to your wife. You know the thoughts that you're supposed to have. You, the reason why you're in this trouble right now is because you were playing around with those thoughts in the first place. Instead, you're supposed to take captive of those thoughts. Make them submissive to Christ. You need somebody who's going to call you out and call you up. I'm going to tell you what I need inside of my life. I don't need somebody who is nice to me. Ooh, come on now. I don't need somebody who's nice to me. I need somebody who's going to call me out, who's going to be honest with me. And here's something else that's so important for us. Even if you have an accountability partner, you are only accountable as you allow yourself to be. Because you can lie to them all day long. You can lie to them. You can lie to yourself. But it's going to be exposed one day. So why not get it out now? It's going to come out one day. And I'm not even talking about for eternity. You're going to find yourself in trouble. So why not just get it out now? That's my idea. Like, if I, if I could just get the sin out now, hey, you know what? Now I'm not carrying this burden any longer. Now let's just get it taken care of. 
You're only as accountable as you allow yourself to be. You need accountability. You want freedom from ever entering into that valley again? I don't know about you, but I don't want that sin cycle inside of my life. I've been there far too many times. And I'm telling you, the way that I found victory from entering into that valley any longer is accountability. And then the second one is the word. Come on, somebody. I'm going to tell you what. You need the word of God inside of your life. You want to show me somebody who keeps continuing to fall into sin, I'm going to show you somebody who is not living the word of God. I'm going to show you somebody who is not feeding on the word of God. I'm going to show you somebody who is not constantly in the word of God. Let's call out some pastors in this, right? You show me a pastor who has fallen, who had a moral failure, who had an affair on his wife or whatever it is, I'm going to show you a pastor who was not in the word of God every single day. Because when you are feeding on the word of God, the world is a bunch of junk food. And what do I want with that? It doesn't satisfy anyway. It never satisfies. Cookies don't satisfy. You think, right? Man, I go to crumble cookie and I have one and I'm like, I need another one of those things. And then Jenny says to me, she says, you know that they're like 1,000 calories a piece. And I'm like, well, I need, I need 3,000 calories right now. That's what I need. <laughs> I got any sweet tooth people in here? I got some sweet tooth people in here? Come on, somebody. I got a sweet tooth. I want to be able to have some, some cereal. That's what I have at nighttime. I want cereal at nighttime. Some of y'all have ice cream at nighttime. You can have your ice cream. I want some cereal. And I'm talking about good cereal, like, 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 like Cocoa Pebbles, some sugar, right? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I like a sweet tooth. But when I am feeding on the good stuff, when I'm constantly feeding on the good stuff, I don't want that stuff any longer. See, there's a reason why like, I eat like a dozen eggs a day. And some of you are like, you're weird. Yeah, I know, I know. I eat like a dozen eggs a day because when I eat a dozen eggs a day, then I'm not craving junk food. When I'm feeding on good stuff, when I'm eating steak, when I'm eating eggs, when I'm eating cottage cheese, because she's gross, because she's gross, it's gross, and I got, I got any men in here who believe that cottage cheese is gross? All the women are like, cottage cheese is amazing, it's fantastic, I hate it, I hate it, but you know what I do? I eat it, I eat it, because when I'm feeding on cottage cheese, it doesn't want to make me go get some chips. I got any chips in here, any salty Come on now, some of you are like, I don't have that sweet tooth, but man, give me a pack of Doritos. Anybody Doritos? Some Cheetos up in here? Cheetos? Ooh, man, give me some orange fingers. Nom, 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 nom. You know what I'm talking about? This is what I'm talking about. This is how some of y'all live, and isn't it? This is how we live. Because when we don't feed on the good stuff, we crave all the junk. And so when you're not feeding on the word of God, you're creating on all the junk that the world has to offer. So I'm telling you, when you're not living the word and feeding on the word, that's when you're going to sin. So you want a way to not get in there anymore? Feed on the Word of God. Feed on the Word of God. James 1, 22 through 25. But don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the Word and don't obey it, it's like glancing in the face of the mirror. You see yourself, walk away, forget what it looked like. But if you look carefully on the perfect law, that sets you free. Somebody say free. free. It's going to set you free. And if you do what it says and don't forget what it heard, then God is going to bless what you are doing. Psalms 119.11 says this, that I have hidden your word inside of my heart so that I might not sin against you. So I've got to be able to have the word of God inside of my heart. The only way it's going to get inside of my heart is if it goes into my head. The only way it's going to get inside of my head is if it goes to my eyes. The only way it's going to go into my eyes is if I open it up every single day. Come on now. So that I might not, what? Sin. You don't even have to go in that valley no more. Come on, somebody. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the word of God is alive, Woo! for the word of God is powerful, come on somebody, it is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, it's going to cut between the soul and the spirit, that's what I need inside of my life, I need the word of God to sit there and cut me, so that I am not living in sin any longer, I need the word of God to be able to do the work inside of me, between joint and marrow it exposes, again it brings light, come on now. Don't live in darkness. Instead, feed on the word of God so that it's going to bring light into that situation. Psalms 119, 105 through 106. This is my theme verse for the entire year. And it says this, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light. Somebody say light. A light to my path. I don't want to live in darkness anymore. I promised it once. I'm going to promise it again. I will. I will. I will obey 
your regulations. How are you going to keep yourself from even going into that valley of sin any longer? Have accountability. Make sure that you're feeding on the word of God. It is my daily bread. It is my breath of life. I need it. I need it. I need it. But that's not it. It's not only it. For us to be able to stop from entering into the valley of sin, what would happen if we stopped being victims and we started to take responsibility for sin? What if we took responsibility not just for my sin, but for the sins of other people? See, when it comes to sin, there are certain ways that we can live. The, the first one that we can do is we can be victims. And we call this, this is the Adam and Eve principle. Oh yeah, the very first sin comes around. God calls them up. Where are you guys at? Well, we, 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 were, we, were, we were naked. How do you know that? Well, just like because uh, we sinned. But it was not my fault. It was her fault. Amen. And then she says, it wasn't my fault. It was the serpent's fault. Victims. Blaming. Blaming. Victims. Or we could take the next step. We could take the next step and we can actually acknowledge our sin and then we can repent from it. This is called the David principle. And David was, was caught in, a, in an adulterous affair with this woman called Bathsheba. And he was called out. He was called out by, by a prophet. And he acknowledged it. And then, he, and then he asked God to repent. He repented before him. And God saw him and counted his righteousness. He said, this is a man after, my, after God's own heart. And we find ourselves in that place that we want to be able to acknowledge our sin and repent from our sin. But what about when it's not our own sin? that is causing the trouble that we're in. And I call this the Aiken theory. The reason why I call this the Aiken theory is because when I'm reading the Word of God and I see this man named Aiken who had committed this horrible sin and caused all of this catastrophe on other people, he was found out. And then he was punished, and not only him, but the other people around him. Because you all know that sin does not just affect you, but sin affects the people around you, right? But I'm wrecked with this question when I hear this story and read this story. I know that the wages of sin are death. But I also know that my God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And he is a gracious and a loving God, is he not? He's gracious and he's loving. And we see him be merciful so many times. And so my question, and I know there's a lot of people moving up here. Go ahead and draw in right back to me. Here's the question. Did Achan have to die? Did he have to die? I'm not talking about just because of his sin. My, my question is, did he have to die? Because I don't know about you, but I've seen too many times where there was somebody that angered God, and then God said, hey, I'm going to do this. There was a city called Sodom and Gomorrah, and he just told Abraham, he said, I'm going to wipe them all out. And then Abraham was pleading before God, pleading before God, pleading before God, trying to find any kind of righteous people. It wasn't there, but he, he was actually pleading before God. God told Moses, I'm sick and tired of these Israelites. They keep, they keep doing messing up things, and I'm just sick and tired of them. I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm going to start over with you. But Moses pleaded before God, God, have mercy on your people. And he became merciful. 
What what would happen if we took responsibility not only for our own sins, but we took the responsibility for other people's sins? There's a a leader named Nehemiah, and Nehemiah, when he was asking God and going before God, he prayed for the forgiveness of his sins and the sins of his father. What what about Esther, who who went before the king Xerxes at at almost the expense of her own life, pleading for her people to be saved? What would happen if we became a church that didn't take responsibility for our own sins, but for the sins of our brothers and sisters next to us? What would it look like then? What would church look like then? I believe that if we took responsibility and stopped being victims and started living as victors that God has for us, that we wouldn't blame others and that we would not refuse responsibility, but we would take that responsibility upon ourselves. And it would be a church that would look like the kingdom of God. It would look like the kingdom of God. Because I love you too much to see you fall into sin. And we are called to be of one body. And so if one part of the body is hurting, is it not the whole body hurting? If one part is infected, is not the whole body infected? So instead, when we see sin, we take responsibility for it and we call it out in other people. Did he have to die? What would have happened if Joshua would have gone before God? God, please don't make me do this. If he just repents for his sin and he calls back and he just wants to give it all, what would happen if that moment would have been there? I don't know for sure. I can only theorize. But I see what happens in other places throughout Scripture. And I see how the Bible teaches us to stop being victims and start living as victors. Stop living like the world, blaming other people for my problems, blaming other people for my trouble. And I take responsibility for myself, but I don't just take responsibility for myself. I take responsibility for the people around me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I can see that scripture teaches me not just to take responsibility for myself, but for the people that God has put around me. Because Galatians 6, 1 through 2 says this. It says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path. That's responsibility. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Instead, share each other's burdens. And in this way, in this way, obey the law of Christ. What would our church look like? If we stop pointed fingers and we lend out a helping hand. I'm not going to be a victim and blame other people. I'm not going to be a victim and refuse to take responsibility. Instead, I live a victorious life. And I want to make sure that nobody else is going to enter into that valley of sin as well. And so I take responsibility of my brother and my sister. I take responsibility and make sure that I'm walking that path, and I want to make sure that they're walking that path with me. Whew. I don't want to be a victim. I don't want to see you be a victim. Instead, I believe that there's victory, and that victory is found in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5, 15, uh, 57 says that. But thanks God, because he gives us victory. Victory. Somebody say victory. I'm tired of seeing victims any longer. I'm tired of being able to see people live in a victim mentality. Instead, God has made us victorious. Victorious warriors that he's made us to be. And let's begin to live that way. What would happen if we took responsibility the way that Jesus took responsibility for your sin and for my sin and all of the sins of this world? What would happen if we followed his example and he took it all upon himself? It wasn't his fault. He didn't do anything. He was completely blameless, yet he took it all upon himself. And you say, well, I'm not Jesus. Yeah, but we're supposed to follow in his footsteps because John 15 says this. It says, this is my commandment. Love each other. In the same way that I have loved you. 
There's no greater love. And I'm going to lay my life down for you. Take responsibility. Now, this is important to be able to say when we're talking about responsibility as well. I'm not talking about being a busybody. Come on, anybody know any busybodies? I'm not talking about being a busybody, getting up on, in everybody's business. I'm talking about the people that God has put inside of your small circle of individuals. I got a small circle. I got larger circles. I have responsibilities. I'm talking about those moments. I'm talking about the moments that God has for you to be able to call out your friend, call out your brother, call out your sister. Call those people out and say, no, 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 no. This is not how you're supposed to live. This is how we're supposed to live. How? How do we stop from entering into the valley any longer? The valley of sin. Have accountability. Live by the word. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. And live as a victor. This is the life that God has for us. This is called the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Now i got to be honest with you. One of the things that it said is that we're supposed to go before our, our brothers and sisters and, and gently and humbly try to bring them back. That's the thing that I have a hard time with. I'm just going to be honest with you. The thing I struggle with is I'm going to call it out, and I'm going to call it out hard. Anybody been called out hard by me in this church? I'm, I know you got some hands. I got some hands. It's the things that I'm working on too. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I just want you to know that it comes from a loving place because I care about you too much to stay silent any longer. There's freedom. There's freedom found. You don't have to be a slave to your sin any longer. You don't have to be a slave to your sin any longer. You don't have to be a slave to your sin any longer. That cycle that you've been in over and over and over again, it can be broken like that. It can be broken through the power of Jesus Christ. When you give him everything that you have, you don't have to go back to that sin any longer. Is anybody ready for some freedom today? Is anybody ready to live in freedom today? Is anybody ready to never go back into that valley any longer? I believe that this is what God has for us. I believe that it's time to take responsibility and for you to be able to experience some victory today. Does anybody want to live in victory today? You want to live in victory today? Church, could you please stand up today? See, I, I gave you a lot. I gave you a lot of teaching in this. It was, it was, it was a heavy message. It wasn't something that was lighthearted in any kind of way because sin is not lighthearted. And sin is going to eat you up inside. And so I don't know about you, but I want to get out of that cycle of sin. I don't need that sin in my life any longer. And I believe that there's victory that can be found. There's freedom that can be found in this place today. Can I get an amen? I'm going to ask my pastors to be able to come across, uh, find a place around here because I know that there's somebody who needs victory in a big way. And I'm going to tell you what, it takes some big, bold steps to be able to get out of that dark valley and to be able to walk in the victory that God has for you. But why not get it over and done with right now? Why not go ahead and acknowledge that sin right now? Why not go ahead and repent of that sin right now? And why not be able to find victory out of that valley of sin that you've been in for far too long? I believe that there's victory that can be found in this place. I believe that there's freedom that can be found in this place. We have been praying for it and believing for it in a big way. Church, we're going to be bringing a, a song of praise to God. And I want to encourage you that if you're in this place and you've been living in a life, you've been living that life of sin, you've been walking through that cycle of sin over and over again, and you're just sick and tired of it. You're sick and tired of feeling this way. You're sick and tired of going through it over and over again. And it's time for you to be able to find freedom. I'm going to ask you to do something very, very big and very, very bold. And that's to be able to take a step out. Come find one of our pastors and repent before God. Expose it to the light so that the darkness is no longer there. That the sin is no longer eating you alive. And instead you can have victory today. When our band begins to play, people are going to start worshiping. People are going to be closing their eyes. And that's the opportunity for you to take a step out of your seat and find the victory that God has for you today.